autobiography is a book a person writes about his own life. It's usually full of all sorts of boring details. Don't worry, we'll soon have it back in place. Ah! This is not an autobiography. Boys is hideous and horrible. I would never write a history of myself. Ah! Let that be a lesson to you, boy. But throughout my younger days, a number of things happened to me that I've never forgotten. Go, go faster! Go on! Make it go faster! Put your foot down! Even after a lapse of 50 or 60 years, they remain seared on my memory. I don't have to search for any of them. All I have to do is skim them off the top of my consciousness. Dahl, go and heat my seat in the box. I want it warm. Some are funny. Some are painful. Some are unpleasant. I will not allow you to be treated with cruelty. I suppose that's why I've always remembered them so vividly. And it was your idea. Roald Dahl, you were a murderer. All are completely true. My father, Harald Dahl, was a Norwegian from a small town called Sarpsborg. His father, my grandfather, owned a store that sold everything from cheese to chicken wire. Get the ladder, Harald. The roof is leaking again, and make sure you fix it properly this time. When my father was 14, he was up on the roof replacing some loose tiles, when he slipped and fell. He broke his arm just below the elbow. The doctor was immediately called. Stand aside, please. Medic in attendance. Where is the patient? It's my son, Harold, sir. Uh, where is he? He's the one lying on the floor. Ah. Right. Let's examine him, shall we? Mm. Open wide. Say ah. Ah. It's his arm that's hurt, not his throat. Of course. I was getting to that. <laughs> what is it, doctor? A simple dislocation. Don't worry. We'll soon have it back in place. Ah! Can somebody get me some brandy? For the boy's pain? No, for me. Steady the old nerve. Oh. The doctor was so drunk, he mistook a fracture for a dislocated shoulder. I'll manipulate the arm until the shoulder pops back in. Well, will it hurt him? Only a little. Ready? Here we go. Uh, oh! By the time he had finished, a splinter of bone was sticking out through my father's skin. His arm was ruined. Surgery then was not what it is today, so they simply amputated below the elbow. Well, young man, remember not to go clambering about on slippery roofs in future. Over time, my father taught himself to manage with just one arm. He could tie his shoelaces one-handed as fast as most people do it with two, and he invented a fork with a sharpened bottom edge so that he could wield both implements in the one hand. The loss of his arm, he used to say, caused him only one serious inconvenience. I always found it impossible to cut the top of a boiled egg. Harald and his older brother, Oscar, wanted to leave Norway to seek their fortunes. Grandfather refused to support this tomfool idea. You must stay here and help with the shop. I forbid you to travel overseas. They ran away and worked their way to Paris on a cargo ship. Here they split up. Oscar went to La Rochelle, bought a fishing boat, and was soon the richest man in town with a fleet of trawlers and his own canning factory. My father set himself up in the shipbroking business. A shipbroker is like an enormous shopkeeper for ships, supplying everything they need when they come into port. By far the most important item is fuel. In those days, fuel for shipping meant only one thing, coal. So Harold decided that his business should be based in the greatest coaling port in the world, Cardiff. From here on, we have what sounds like one of those exaggerated fairy stories of success. The business prospered. Will you marry me? Father acquired a beautiful wife, Marie, whom he had met in Paris. Oh, yes. <laughs> 
Within a few years, they could afford to move into a fine house in the village of Llandaff, just outside the city. A toast to our new home. Our, our new, new home. home. <laughs> Children soon followed. Louis and Ellen. Darling, I love you. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> but they did not live happily ever after. Marie died soon after Ellen was born. My father was desolate and terribly lonely. It was quite obvious that he must try to find himself another wife. His two small children needed a stepmother to care for them. He decided to take a holiday in Norway. One day he took a trip on a small coastal steamer on the Oslo Fjord. Good day to you, madam. He met a young woman called Sophie Hesselberg. Good day, sir. Harold knew a good thing when he saw one. Will you marry me? He proposed within a week. I will. And the fairy tale began all over again. The shipbroking business continued to expand. A toast to our new home. Our, our new home. home. <laughs> they moved into an imposing country mansion beside the village of Radar, about eight miles from Cardiff, surrounded by acres of farmland. The fields were full of milking cows, the styes were full of pigs. There was a plowman, a cowman, and a couple of gardeners. And of course, there were children, four over the next six years. First Astri, then myself, Roald Dahl, then two more girls, Ulfhild and Elsa. My father had made it. He was a rip-roaring success. For our happy family, the world seemed like a wonderful place to be. But life can turn on a sixpence. Astri was far and away my father's favorite child. He adored her beyond measure. One spring morning, she died from acute appendicitis. She was seven years old. My own eldest daughter, Olivia, would die from measles at exactly the same age, 42 years later. But I had no knowledge then that such a tragedy was waiting for me. I was only three. <laughs> Mother was heartbroken, but for father it was a devastating blow. He was so overwhelmed with grief, he stopped caring about life. He thought only of his beloved daughter in heaven, and I'm sure he wished to join her there. He died of pneumonia very soon after. He was 57 years old. Mother was alone. Young Norwegian woman in a foreign land with five children dependent on her. It would have been easy to retreat back to her family in Norway, but my father had left her with a dying wish, and she was determined to see it honored. The best schools are English schools. They are better than any schools in the world. No child of mine shall be educated anywhere other than England. It's astonishing how little one remembers about one's life before the age of seven or eight. I went for a whole year to a kindergarten called Elm Tree House, but I couldn't tell you a thing about what my classroom looked like or the faces of the two sisters who ran the school. All I do remember are the journeys there and back racing along at enormous speeds on my new tricycle. These were the good old days when the sight of a motor car on the street was an enormous event. It was quite safe then for tiny children to go tricycling and whooping their way to school in the center of the highway. When I was seven, my mother decided I should go to a proper boys' school. Landaff had a well-known prep school in the shadow of the cathedral, and I was a pupil there for the next two years. Over time, I made some friends, and we would walk together to and from school. On the way home, we always passed the sweet shop. No, we didn't. This is all true, remember, so I must be honest. We never passed the sweet shop. We always stopped and lingered outside, gazing in at the big glass jars filled with the most magical confections. Almost every evening, you'd find us there, drooling. Suckers. Thwaites. Strawberry bonbons. Bressington. Licorice bootlaces. And me. Licorice bootlaces were my absolute favourites. 
You should never eat licorice bootlaces. Says who? My father. He's a doctor, you know. You have told us that, Thwaites. About a thousand times. He says licorice bootlaces are made out of rat's blood. Rubbish! It's true. Every rat catcher in the country takes his rats to the licorice bootlace factory. And how do they turn rats into licorice bootlaces? They wait till they got thousands, and then they boil them up in a big, shiny cauldron. Then they lower a cruncher into the cauldron to crush up the bones. What's left is a pulpy sort of substance they call... Rat mash. That doesn't sound like a licorice bootlace. Of course not. Men shovel the rat mash onto the concrete floor. It cools and hardens. Then they slice it up into licorice bootlaces. I don't care what they're made out of. I love them. You'll get ratitis. What? Ratitis. What happens when you catch ratitis? Your teeth become very sharp and pointy. A stumpy little tail grows out of your back just above your bottom. And do you start squeaking? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> I think I've got it. Me too. Help me, Thwaites. I've got ratitis. My father told me. He should know. He is a doctor. Shall we go in, then? Let's work out what we're getting first. Then we can be in and out as fast as we can. I'm getting licorice bootlaces. Don't be a fool. I'm getting tonsil ticklers. I wouldn't. They're made out of chlorophyll. All right. I'll have pear drops. I'm having licorice bootlaces. It's your funeral. I'll have a gobstopper. Are we going in or not? You go first. I'm not going first. You go first. It was your idea, doll. You go first. In 1923, the sweet shop in Llandaff was the centre of our lives. To us, it was what a bar is to a drunk or a church to a bishop. But it had one terrible drawback. You'd better have some lolly on you. Mrs Pratchett, the owner, was a horror. I don't want you in here just to look round. Either you forks out or you get out. She never smiled. Filth seemed to cling around her. Her apron was grey and greasy. Her blouse had bits of breakfast all over it. Well, do you want something or not? Uh, a penny's worth of licorice boot aces, please. Is that it? Oh, hardly worth bothering with. It was her hands that disturbed us most. They were covered in dirt and grime, as if she'd been handling coal all day. It was these disgusting fingers that she plunged into the jars to pull out our sweets. Uh, that's close enough to a penny's worth. And she was mean. She never put sweets in a bag. Instead, she twisted them up in little sheets of newspaper ripped from yesterday's Daily Mirror. Now, be on your way and keep your thieving hands off them chocolates on the way out. We had it in for Mrs Pratchett in a big way. Many schemes to teach her a lesson were put forward, but none would do it. Until one evening after school, we made an exciting discovery. We had a secret hiding place beneath a loose floorboard situated towards the back of our classroom. Excess sweets were stored there, and small treasures like conkers, monkey nuts, and bird's eggs. There's something down there. I'll get it. Look at that! Ah, what is it? It stinks! A dead mouse. What should we do with it? Throw it out of the window, quick! Hold on a tick. Don't throw it away. Why not? Truth is more important than modesty, therefore I must tell you that it was I, and I alone, who had the idea for the great and daring mouse plot. Why don't we slip it into one of Mrs Pratchett's jars when she's not looking? Then when she puts her dirty hand in to grab some sweets, she'll grab a dead mouse instead. They stared at me in wonder. As the beautiful simplicity of the plot sank in, they cheered and slapped me on the back. Yeah! Oh, really? Genius, though! You had the idea, so you can be the one to put the mouse in the jar. Put it in the gobstoppers. They're never behind the counter. I'll ask for a shiver sucker, and when she turns around, you can slip it in. OK, come on, let's go. She's going to be so shocked. <laughs> and what do you horrible lot want? One shiver sucker, please. Is that it? Yes, thank you. Oh. You are one sherbet sucker. 
next time I don't want you all trooping in here if only one of you is buying. Now get out! <laughs> Did you do it? Of course he did. Well done, you. What a super show. I felt like a hero. I was a hero. It was marvellous to be popular. The flush of triumph lasted until we passed the shop again on our way to school the next morning. Let's go in and see if it's still there. Hang on. Why is it closed? We pressed our faces to the window and looked inside. Mrs Pratchett was nowhere to be seen. The gobstopper jar's gone. It's on the floor, look. Smashed to bits, and there's gobstoppers everywhere. There's the mouse! We could all see the forlorn little corpse lying amongst the wreckage. She must have got one heck of a shock. Grabbing a dead mouse instead of a gobstopper would be a pretty frightening experience. Well, it's obvious what happened. What? Heart attack. I'm afraid you've killed her. Me? Don't you mean we? You're the one who put it in there, and it was your idea. Well, dull, you were a murderer. At school, Mr. Coombs looked grim. Silence! Stop that talking. I want absolute silence. Line up in your forms at the double. He's looking for the killer. <laughs> it wasn't for me. I, I don't want to go to jail. I said silence! Madam? The boys are ready for inspection. A single door swung open. I half expected policemen to come bounding out ready to handcuff me. It was a great relief when instead out trotted a tiny familiar figure. She's alive! Thwaites, she's alive! Take as long as you need, Mrs Pratchett. We can wait all day for you to identify the culprits. I'll start this end, whoever they were. They weren't very big. Every boy in the school was watching as she came down the line of our form. Closer, closer. Nasty cheeky lot, these little boys. They got no manners. They comes in my shop and nicks things when I ain't looking. I never get trouble with girls, but boys, boys is idiots and horrible. I don't have to tell you that, do I, Edmaster? <clears throat> That's him! Me, me, what have I done? Shut up! That's him, all right. I know him a mile away, the scummy little bounder. And there's his mates, look. Nasty, dirty little pigs. You've got their names, have you? I do indeed. Bressington, Thwaites and Dahl. We were all taken straight to the Headmaster's study. He was a giant of a man with a face like a ham and a mass of rusty coloured hair sprouting in a tangle all over the top of his head. In his hands, he held a long yellow cane that curved round the top like a walking stick. You boys have shamed the school and must be punished accordingly. Bend over, Dahl. Tighter, boy. Touch your toes. Mr Coombs took a firm, wide stance, raised the cane high and brought it down with a crack like a pistol shot. Order. I looked round in shock. Lay into him. Sitting in a big leather armchair, the tiny loathsome figure of Mrs Pratchett was bouncing up and down with excitement. Get down, boy. You get an extra one every time you straighten up. That's telling the little blighter. Now let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> By gum, those four strokes were real whoppers. Mr. Coombe seemed to respond to my cries like an athlete spurred on by the crowd. Each one hurt more than the last. He was well practised and had a perfect aim, able to land each stroke in exactly the same place. It was bad enough being caned on fresh skin, but when it's on wounded flesh, the agony is unbelievable. That evening, after supper, my three sisters had their baths before me. Then it was my turn. As I was about to step into the tub... What's happened to you? Who did this? Tell me at once. I had no choice but to tell her the whole sorry tale. When I'd finished, she said to our nurse... Get them into bed, Nanny. I'm going out. Mother, no. Please come back. 
she took no notice. I watched her out of my bedroom window, marching down the road towards school. When she returned, I was tucked up in bed. Sleep tight, my sweet boy. Did you see Mr. Coombs' mother? Yes, I did. What did he say? Well, I told him it was wrong to beat small children. They don't do that where I come from. What did he say? He said I was a foreigner, and I didn't understand how British schools were run. <laughs> I told him this is not a British school. This is a Welsh school. I wish you hadn't done that. It would make me look silly. I will not allow you to be treated with cruelty. What will you do? Well, as soon as we can, we will find you an English school. Will it be a boarding school? It will have to be. I'm not ready to move the whole family to England just yet. When will that be, Mother? After the summer holidays. Try not to worry. Go to sleep now. Those magic words, the summer holidays. The mere mention of them used to send shivers of joy rippling over my skin. All my summer holidays, from when I was four until I was 17, were spent in the same idyllic place. And that place was Norway. The journey itself was epic. From Cardiff to Paddington by train, then a dash across London to King's Cross to catch the Newcastle connection. There we would board a boat for the two-day crossing to Christiania, as Oslo was known then. We stopped off for one night to see best the mama and best the papa, my mother's parents. Tears flowed down wrinkled old faces as their gloomy house came alive with the sound of children's voices. And the next day we were off again along the Oslo fjord to our final destination, the island of Tjoma, the most magical place on earth. There were wooden skeletons of shipwrecks on Tjoma and big white bones on the beaches and wild raspberries and mussels clinging to the rocks and shaggy long-haired goats. We stayed in the only hotel on the island, a simple wooden building painted white. Here they served the most amazing breakfasts, with about 50 different dishes to choose from and the most incredibly fresh fish. I only ever had one unpleasant experience in Norway, when my mother took me to see the doctor. Open wide and say, ah. Ah. Hmm. What is it, Doctor? He has adenoids. What should we do? Uh, we can sort this out in two seconds. Open your mouth again, Rod. Ah. Uh, Here we go. Uh, ah. Ow. The doctor had <laughs> used a tiny blade to sever the adenoids from the back of my throat. Before I knew it, a whole mass of flesh and blood came tumbling Ow. out of my mouth, and I howled. Spit it all out. There's a good boy. I thought he might have cut out the whole of the middle of my head. He doesn't have adenoids anymore. That was in 1924, and such operations without anaesthetic were common practice in those days. I wonder, though, what you would think if some doctor did that to you today. In 1925, when I was nine, I set out on the greatest adventure of my life thus far. Good morning, Mrs. Dahl. Good morning, Headmaster. Boarding school. And this is young Roald, I presume. Good morning, Headmaster. St. Peter's was the closest English prep school mother could find to Wales, just across the Bristol Channel in Western Supermare. It was built on a hill above the town, a three-storied stone building that looked rather like a lunatic asylum. Mother and I stood on the threshold with the wind whipping in off the sea. Every piece of clothing I wore was brand new with my name sewn into it. Well, Roald, I'll bid you goodbye. Goodbye, Mother. Uh, may I send him some little treats now and again, Headmaster? By all means do, my dear Mrs. Dahl. 
In those days, an English school was purely a money-making business owned and operated by the headmaster. It suited him to give the boys as little food as possible and encourage parents to feed their offspring by parcel post. I'll send you a few oranges and apples once a week. And some sweets, perhaps, and a currant cake. There's nothing like the taste of home cooking, is there? The headmaster gave a flashing grin, the kind a shark might give to a small fish just before he gobbles it up. Right, Dahl. Off you go and report to Matron. Goodbye, Mrs. Dahl. I shouldn't linger if I were you. We'll look after him. Goodbye, my beautiful boy. Mother got back in the taxi. I stood and watched her slowly disappearing down the school drive. And I began to cry. <laughs> Good morning, boys. Good morning, Matron. Welcome to the St. Peter's dormitories. Your home for the next term and beyond. At St. Peter's, the ground floor was all classrooms. The first floor was all dormitories. On the dormitory floor, the matron ruled supreme. I am in charge here. On this floor, you follow my rules and do as I say. If you obey these simple dictates, then we should all get along very well. She was a large, fair-haired woman, probably no more than 28. But whether she was 28 or 68 made no difference because she was a grown-up, and all grown-ups were dangerous creatures at this school. However, if you fail to live up to the high standards expected of you here, then woe betide you. Woe betide you indeed. She ruled the dorms with a rod of steel. As soon as you set foot on her floor, you were in her power. And the source of this power was the headmaster. At any time she liked, she could send you to report to that merciless giant to be caned on the spot. We soon learned the routine. Good night, boys. Sleep well. After lights out, Matron would prowl the corridors like a panther, trying to catch the sound of a whisper. She had phenomenal hearing and she seemed to be able to glide along in complete silence like a spectre, so we never knew if it was safe to talk or not. One night, a boy called Rag tiptoed out of the dorm and sprinkled caster sugar all over the linoleum floor of the corridor. Huh? Huh? Who did this? How dare you do this? Own up immediately! I want the name of the filthy little beggar who sugared the corridor! Confess! I lay there shivering with excitement, waiting for the inevitable. Rag, Rag, don't own up. We won't give you away. Right! I'm calling the headmaster! The whole school was herded out into the corridor where the dreadful deed had been done. What? No one has the gumption or the integrity to step forward and admit responsibility! The headmaster railed at us. Red splotches appeared on his face and flecks of spit shot out of his mouth as he bellowed. Very well. All parcels of food being sent from home are confiscated for the rest of the term! I will not tolerate such behaviour! And so we went hungry. Yet none of us ever breathed a word of complaint to our parents. Sunday morning was letter-writing time. At nine o'clock, the whole school went to their desks to spend an hour writing home. Dear Mama. Letter-writing was a habit that stuck with me. From that first Sunday morning until the day my mother died 32 years later, I wrote to her at least once a week. I am having a lovely time here at St. Peter's, and we play football nearly every day. Not everything I said in my letters was true. I never told the story about our tuck being confiscated or about how Matron dealt with Tweedy's snoring. Tweedy was in my form. One night, inexplicably, he started to snore. Matron was in like a flash. I heard talking. Who was talking? 
We lay there in silence. Tweedy, who was a very tired sort of boy, dozed on. Snoring is a disgusting habit. Only the lower classes do it. A gentleman who is snoring needs to wash his mouth out. Matron crossed to the bed where poor unconscious Tweedy lay with his mouth agape. She took a cake of soap and a pair of scissors from her pockets and began shaving soap flakes into his open mouth. Tweedy began to gurgle. White bubbles appeared around his lips. The bubbles grew until his whole head seemed to be smothered in foaming froth. He gave a great cough and began clawing at his own face. Oh, what's happening? Oh, what's on my face? Stop bawling, Tweedy. Get a flannel and wipe it off. Don't ever let me hear you snoring again. It was quite impossible to tell about these horrors in Arletta's home. The headmaster was always on patrol at letter-writing time, peering over our shoulders, looking for grammatical errors and checking to make sure we said nothing horrid about the school. No boy ever said what he really thought about the food, or the masters, or the thrashings. In order to please that dangerous head, we would, if anything, go the other way and say how much we loved being there. I am looking forward to another wonderful week at St Peter's. Lots of love. From boy. I was desperately homesick when I first went to St. Peter's. Homesickness is a bit like seasickness. You don't know how awful it is till you get it. And when you do, it hits you right in the top of the stomach and you want to die. I was so homesick at first that I devised a stunt to get myself out of school, even if it was just for a few days. Come in! What is it, doll? My tummy hurts, matron. What do you expect, guzzling currant cake all day long? I couldn't eat. It hurts too much. <sighs> Pop this thermometer in your mouth. A few weeks earlier, one of my sisters had suffered an attack of appendicitis. I was able to observe her symptoms and replicate them exactly. Where does it hurt? All down the side. Here? Uh, I guess it's there. Hmm. Let me have the thermometer. <sighs> Odd. Temperature's normal. I've been sick all morning. There's nothing left to bring up, but I, I still feel sick. <laughs> this was the clincher. Matron regarded small boys as inveterate liars, but she had a nurse's training, and she didn't want a burst appendix on her hands. I'm going to recommend that the headmaster telephones your mother and gets her to collect you at once. I said nothing. I just lay there trying to look ill. But my heart was singing out with all sorts of wonderful songs of praise and joy. Mother took me home across the Bristol Channel and straight to Dr Dunbar's surgery in Cardiff. He examined me and I repeated my routine. Put your shirt back on and take a seat, would you, old? What's wrong with me, Dr Dunbar? Nothing is wrong with you. You're faking this. I sat silent and miserable as he gazed at me with a penetrating eye. You have no inflammation. It's quite easy to tell. Let me guess. You were homesick? I was. Mm. Everyone is at first. You have to stick it out. Life is tough, and the sooner you learn to cope with it, the better for you. What will you tell the school? I will tell them that you have a severe infection of the stomach that I am curing with pills. It will mean you need to stay at home for three more days, but you must promise you will never do anything like this again. Your mother has enough on her hands without having to rush over to school to get you. I promise. Good lad. Somehow I survived the first term and made it through to the Christmas holidays. Oh, the bliss of being free from the fierce discipline and the perpetual fear of the long yellow cane. This morning we have a treat for the whole family. What is it, Mother? Look out of the window. For Christmas, Mother had splashed out on the first motor car we had ever owned, an enormous French beast called a De Dion Bouton. Ellen has had two half-hour driving lessons and she's ready to take us all out for the day. Come on. In those days, nobody took a driving test. An hour of practice, then off you jolly well went. Ooh. Ooh. How fast will 
it go? <laughs> It'll do 60, probably more when we really get it going. Make it do 60. <laughs> do you know where the brakes are? Quiet, Mother, I need to concentrate. Go faster, go on. Make it go faster. Put your foot down. Shall I? <laughs> Keep your eyes on the road. We were doing about 35 when we came to a sharpish bend. My sister slammed on the brakes, the wheels locked, and we went into a sideways skid before crashing into the hedge with a marvellous crunch of mud guards and metal. Glass flew in all directions, as did passengers, scattered all along the hedgerow. Miraculously, nobody was hurt very much. Except me. Right. Oh, my poor darling. Am I all right, Mother? Oh, your nose is bleeding a little. Lean back and hold this handkerchief against your face. Are you sure I'm all right? Of course you are. No, I would never let anything happen to you. Ellen, get that thing going again. I'll try. Back it out of the hedge. And hurry up about it. We must get Rua to a doctor. Proceeding at about four miles an hour the whole way, we headed for Dr Dunbar's. I say, Mrs Dahl, is everything all right? Ruat has had a small accident, Doctor. Show him. I removed the blood-soaked handkerchief. My nose hurts. Oh, I'm not surprised. It's been cut nearly clean off. Mother! Shh. It will be all right. Oh, of course it will. Of course it will. I'll, I'll sew it back on again. Can you do that? I can try. My nose was hanging on by a single thread of skin. Soon I found myself on a table in the doctor's house, held down by strong hands, while cotton wool soaked in chloroform was pressed across my mouth. Breathe deeply. Nice, deep breaths. Then I saw blood-red circles spinning round like a scarlet whirlpool with a black hole in the centre, and the doctor's voice seemed to get further and further away. That's a good boy. I woke up in my own bed, with my anxious mother holding my hand. <sighs> You've been asleep for hours. I was beginning to think you wouldn't come round. Did Dr Dunbar sew my nose on again? Yes. Will it stay on? He says it will. You look under your pillow. I lifted the corner. And there lay a beautiful golden sovereign. That's for being brave. You did well. I'm proud of you. I recovered and was soon back at school. Apart from the head, there was one master I feared above all others. Captain Hardcastle sported a moustache the same colour as his hair. It formed a thick orange hedge between his nose and upper lip and ran clear across his face from the middle of one cheek to the middle of the other. Behind the moustache lived an inflamed and savage face. He'd been a soldier in the Great War, hence the title. His head was constantly twitching and jerking in a most alarming fashion. Rumour had it that this was caused by something called shell shock. For reasons I never understood, Captain Hardcastle had it in for me from the very first moment he saw me. Daily I would hear something like, Hold yourself straight, boy. Shoulders back. Or, What's so funny, boy? What are you smacking at? Or, Who? What's your name? Get on with your work. I knew it was only a matter of time before he nailed me good and proper. The crunch came in my second term during evening prep. You all know that the rules for evening prep are simple. You are forbidden to look up from your work, and you are forbidden to talk. Now begin. Disaster struck for me when I foolishly stubbed the nib of my pen into the desk and it broke. A broken nib was never accepted as an excuse for failing to finish a piece of work, and I didn't have any spares. Dobson, Dobson, could you lend me a nib? You boy! You're talking. I saw you talking. Stand up. Sorry, sir, I just... Don't deny it. I distinctly saw you talking behind your hand. Were you trying to cheat? No, sir, I was... Do you deny you were talking? No, sir, but I wasn't cheating. 
Of course you were cheating. Why else would you be speaking to Dobson? Or were you inquiring after his health? I broke my nib, sir. I was asking if he could lend me one. You are lying. I always knew you were a liar and a cheat. I only wanted a nib, sir. I would shut up if I were you. Before you get into even deeper trouble, I am giving you a stripe. These were words of doom. A stripe was given for exceptionally poor work or behaviour, and it automatically meant a thrashing from the head. Come here, boy. He filled in the stripe report, recording my crimes as talking in prep, trying to cheat, and lying. Then he sent me to the headmaster's study. Please, sir, I didn't lie, sir. And I promise I wasn't trying to cheat. Captain Hardcastle says you were doing both. Are you calling him a liar? No, sir. That would be a very serious thing to say about a master. My nib broke and I was just asking Dobson if I could borrow one from him. That's not what Captain Hardcastle says. He says you are asking him for help with your essay. No, sir, I wasn't. I was a long way back and I was only whispering. So I don't think he could have heard what I said. So you are calling him a liar? No, sir. But you could ask Dobson, sir. Ask Dobson? Why should I ask Dobson? He would tell you what I said, sir. Captain Hardcastle is an officer and a gentleman. I hardly need to go asking some silly little boy to verify what Captain Hardcastle has already said, do I? Do I? No, sir. For talking in prep, cheating and lying, you would get six of the best. <coughs> Small boys can be very comradely when a member of their community has got into trouble especially when an injustice has been done. When I got back to the classroom, I was surrounded on all sides by sympathetic faces. The silent support from my peers was the only thing that helped ease the searing, unbearable burning across my buttocks. St Peter's only took pupils up to the age of 11, so eventually the time came to move on. Ruart, I have entered you for Marlborough and Repton. Which one would you like to go to? I had no idea how to answer this question. They were both famous public schools, but I knew nothing more about them. Oh, um, I'll go to Repton. It was an easier word to say than Marlborough. I went up to London with Mother to buy the uniform. I was shocked when I saw the outfit I was supposed to wear. I can't go looking like that. The shop assistant said that if you were going to Repton, then this is exactly what you must wear. Mother made me put all the garb on the night before I was due to get the train up there. It was like some bizarre form of fancy dress. A white shirt with a detachable collar as stiff as a piece of perspex. Trousers with thin pin-striped grey lines running down the side of them. Braces, a black tie, a waistcoat a jacket that was like some kind of tailcoat, and finally, a stiff, wide-brimmed straw hat. I look like a complete idiot. Nonsense. Let's show your sisters how handsome you are. May I present Master Ruel Dahl, student of Repton College in Derbyshire. <laughs> I told you, Mother. I can't wear this to the station tomorrow. I'll be a laughing stock. Nonsense. No one will take the slightest notice of you. If I know one thing about England, it is that the men in this country love to wear eccentric clothes. Mother. Only 200 years ago, they wore pigs on their heads and ruffles on their sleeves. You should count yourself lucky. <laughs> Next day, I boarded the train at Euston with lots of other boys, all wearing the same ridiculous clothes as me. At Repton, prefects were never called prefects. They were called bozers, and they had the power of life and death over junior boys. My name is Carlton, and I am the house bozer for this dorm. For your information, here are some of the offences for which you may be thrashed by a bozer leaving a sock on the changing room floor, burning the toast at tea time, failing to dust the study properly... A bozo properly, could dish out a thrashing for a hundred piddling little misdemeanors. The list was endless. Talking in prep, forgetting to change into house shoes at six o'clock, 
Shall I go on? <laughs> Bozers were dangerous beasts. And to make matters worse, a ritual took place in the dorm after the administration of a thrashing. The victim was required to stand in the middle of the room and lower their trousers so the damage could be inspected. Super job, Williamson. You have a terrific eye. Thanks. You've got every single one in the same place. That's why I'm captain of the cricket team. Of course, I didn't mention any of this in my letters home to Mother. Dear Mama, thanks awfully for the parcel. We had a great supper last night. We fried the sausages and poured the beans all over them. I never ate those sausages. Carlton ate them. I spent two years as Carlton's fag, which meant I was essentially his servant. He was a supercilious and obnoxious boy who somehow always managed to look down his nose at you, even if he were exceedingly tall, as I was. He had three fags, and we were all terrified of him, especially on Sunday mornings when every fag in Repton had to roll up their sleeves and clean their study holder's room. And when I say clean, I mean practically sterilising the place. Time's up, everyone. You've had long enough. After several hours hard at it, Carlton would perform the ritual of inspection. He took out a pure white cotton glove and, taking as much care as a surgeon in an operating theatre, began moving slowly round the study, running his white-gloved finger along every exposed surface in the entire room. Ha! What's this I see? The verdict was inevitably damning. This is dust, isn't it? We've cleaned everywhere, Carlton, honestly. Do you dispute that this is dust? If I'm wrong, do tell me. It isn't much dust. I didn't ask if it was much dust or not much dust. I simply asked if it was dust. What can you see on my finger? It's dust, Carlton. Thank you. You have admitted your failure to clean my study properly. Three strokes tonight in the changing room after prayers. The rules of fagging at Repton were incredibly complex. A home bozer, for example, could make any fag he wanted do his bidding. He simply had to shout, and every fag within hearing distance had to drop what they were doing and run to his assistance. Fag! Williamson got hold of me a few weeks after I joined the school during a cold spell of weather. Doll! How can I help you? Go and heat my seat in the box. I want it warm. I had to wipe frost off the seat and then perch there for a full 15 minutes before Williamson arrived to claim his prize. Have you got the ice of it? Yes, Williamson. Is it warm? As warm as I can get it. We'll soon find out, won't we? You can get off now. I got off the lavatory and pulled up my trousers. Williamson lowered his and sat down. Hmm. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad at all. Ah, I shall put you on my list. You're definitely someone I'll use again to heat my bog seat. All through winter, I was Williamson's bog seat warmer. I always carried a paper bag with me to while away the long bog seat warming sessions. I must have read most of the works of Dickens before spring arrived. There were 30 or more masters at Repton, and they were mostly dull and colourless with no interest in teaching whatsoever. Corkers was the exception. He was a vast, ungainly man with drooping bloodhound cheeks and filthy clothes. He was meant to teach mathematics, but his lessons were really an endless series of distractions designed to keep us from even having to consider the subject. Good morning, boys. Now, let's start today's lesson by having a look at the Times crossword. That will be a lot more fun than fiddling around with figures. I hate figures. Figures are probably the dreariest things on Earth. Someone asked him why he taught mathematics. I don't teach mathematics, he replied. I only pretend to teach it. <laughs> Once he brought a two-foot grass snake with him into class. In today's lesson, every one of you must spend time handling this reptile. It will cure all of you forever of a fear of snakes. That didn't work for me. Old Corkers cooked up thousands of splendid things to keep his class happy. One of his favorites, deployed whenever he sensed the class was glazing over, 
was to abruptly stop mid-sentence with a look of intense pain clouding his ancient countenance. By God, this is too much! This is going too far! This, this is intolerable! His head would come up and his great nose would begin to sniff the air. What's the matter, sir? What's happened? I'll tell you what's the matter. Somebody has farted. Use the door as a fan. Open all windows. This was the signal for frantic activity. Everyone leaped to their feet and a well-drilled exercise to remove the noxious fumes was carried out. As for Corkers, he would stroll serenely out of the room, muttering loudly to himself. Cabbage that does it. Mm -hmm. And that would be the last we would see of him for the day. Every now and again, a plain cardboard box would be dished out to every Reptonian. This was always an event that created great excitement, for it was a gift from the great chocolate manufacturers, Cadbury. Inside the box you will find 12 bars of chocolate. 11 of them are new inventions. The 12th is a control bar, a Cadbury's coffee cream bar, which you will all be familiar with. Your job is to mark each bar out of 10 and record a comment explaining your judgment. This was a clever stunt by Cadbury's. It gave them access to some of the greatest chocolate bar experts in the world. Mm. Lemon marshmallow bar. Too subtle for the common palate. Six. The importance of all this for me was that I realized that large chocolate companies took inventing very seriously. I imagined myself working in Mr. Cadbury's inventing room with pots of chocolate and fudge and all sorts of other delicious ingredients bubbling away on stoves. I imagined working there and coming up with something so unbearably delicious that I would run out of the inventing room straight into the great man's office. Mr. Cadbury, Mr. Cadbury, I've got it. I've really got it. What is the meaning of this? No one sees me without an appointment. Try this, sir. It's fantastic. It's irresistible. This had better be good, Dahl. Hmm. is doubled, no, tripled. It was lovely dreaming those dreams. And I've no doubt that years later, when I was searching my brain, looking for a plot for a children's book, I remembered those boxes and started to write something called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. When I was 17, Mother began talking to me about my next steps. This is your last year at Repton. Do you want to go on to Oxford or to Cambridge? In those days, it wasn't difficult to get into either of those great universities, as long as you could pay. I'm not going to university. I want to work for some company that will send me to wonderful faraway places, like Africa or China. These were the days before air travel. The world was full of magical faraway places, so I began applying to any company who might send me abroad. When I went to London for an interview with Shell, my housemaster said it was ridiculous for me even to try. The Shell Eastern staff are the creme de la creme. There will be at least 20 applicants for every vacancy. He was right about the competition. There were 107 boys waiting to be interviewed when I arrived at head office for seven posts. How I got one I do not know, but get one I did. When I returned to Repton, the housemaster shook me warmly by the hand. Congratulations, Dar. Well done, old boy. All I can say is I'm damned glad I don't own any shares in Shell. I didn't care. I was all set. I had a career. It was lovely. I was to join the Shell Company in September when I was exactly 18. I would be an Eastern Staff trainee at a salary of five pounds a week. That summer, for the first time in my life, I did not accompany the family to Norway. Why on earth do you want to go running off all around the world, my darling? I want to see palm trees, and coconuts, and coral reefs, and elephants, and deadly snakes. <sighs> you know, if you get bitten by a black mamba, you die within the hour. 
writhing in agony and foaming at the mouth. How awful. I can't wait. Goodbye, Mother. <laughs> Goodbye, my beautiful boy. I was to be away from home for a lot longer than I thought then. Adolf Hitler had recently become Chancellor of Germany, and the world would soon turn upside down. But that is another story altogether. If all goes well, I may have a go at telling it one of these days. In Roald Dahl's Boy, Roald Dahl was played by Patrick Malahide, Young Dahl by Tarkan Uzun, and Teenage Dahl by Isaac Rice. Dahl's mother was played by Joanna Van Campen, Bressington by Daniel Noel, Thwaites by Devon Ruckley, Matron, Aidy Allen, Dr Dunbar, Richard Nichols, Corkers, Jason Barnett, Carlton, Tom Forrester, Captain Hardcastle, Nick Underwood, and Mrs Pratchett by Elizabeth Bennett. Other parts were played by James Laley, Sam Ricks, Sean Baker and Kirsty Oswald. Roald Dahl's Boy was adapted for radio by Lucy Catherine. It was a BBC Cymru Wales production directed by Helen Perry. Thank you.